We never drank the BEV Kool-Aid. Every vehicle manufacturer in the BEV space is losing money other than Tesla. Are you satisfying a carbon footprint or are you satisfying a financial concern and keeping the companies afloat? New earnings reports for the big automakers show that there's still softness in demand for battery electric vehicles, but that the costs of the overall transition to electric are still quite high. Well, Joe McCabe joins me now from Auto Forecast Solutions for more. Joe, if I'm an auto executive and I'm looking at this situation, my future depends on battery electric vehicles, and yet at this moment, they're not selling as well as I want them to. How concerned should I be? Yeah, the concern here is that this BEV push is an environmental and governmental agenda. It's not a consumer initiative, and that's always a problem when big pushes in this direction. And the, the issue with BEVs right now, it's either... 100% or zero. And the manufacturers should, should be basically applauded for the fact that each year they're increasing their BEV penetration rate. Obviously not where the goals were set, but you got to convince a consumer that a plug is not a disruptor in their life. So when you're a major executive and you're trying to build a portfolio and you have billions and billions of dollars in multiple powertrain strategies, it's very difficult to move that needle. You know, we have to remind people that vehicle manufacturers have one customer. It's called a shareholder. And when shareholder value gets impacted, when margins and revenue don't, don't come in, but the consumers aren't buying the product, not because they're anti-environment, but just because maybe the product doesn't fit in their lifestyle, it's a very difficult needle to move. So you're seeing a lot of manufacturers now pivot, right? GM saying, well, we believe that we need to build a hybrid mm -hmm. strategy to bridge it. We've always believed that. We never drank the the, the BEV Kool-Aid. It's a long, long road to get there and will never be 100%. There's the internal combustion engine will live in perpetuity in certain markets, even with mm. hybrids, they are. So there's a lot of a lot of portfolio balancing going on, a lot of conversation of killing brands and re reappropriating funds. And it's a difficult time for legacy manufacturers that have to carry a lot, a lot of water to satisfy right. millions of consumers. I want to touch on that rebalancing in just a moment, but first, customers aren't buying the way that they're supposed to be buying. Why is that? What are they saying? Do we know why exactly they're not going for these things? Yeah, that's models? funny. The, the word supposed is always funny that you have, we give you a product and a field of <laughs> dreams approach. If you build it, we, you know, we build it, you will come here. And that's not the approach. I maybe have a family that needs uh, to drive a lot or go on vacation uh, once a year and drive across three states or th three provinces. And I, and I don't want to stop three times to do it. Maybe I don't like the cost differential of a BEV to a non-BEV. Um, maybe I'm just not used to it. Maybe I'm not, I'm not comfortable with it. Maybe I live in a high rise. I don't have the ability to plug in. The list of things against BEVs are huge. The list for them are also huge. They are, we're not anti-BE. We're just pro-reality. Uh, they're phenomenal vehicles for that type of consumer. You know, sometimes I say, if I was a Harley owner, I'd say, why doesn't everyone have a Harley? Well, maybe that's not the product for me. So this idea that we're being forced down a path to build a product that may not fit in my lifestyle is a very difficult hurdle to, to get over. Hmm. And at the same time, we know that automakers have mandates to bring in more of these electric vehicles, either government mandates in the case of European countries or their own that they've set in the case of GM, for example. I, I want to ask these issues when we talk about affordability, when we talk about range, let's actually start with affordability. That was really supposed to be the push in recent years, right, to bring that price down to create a mass market electric vehicle. Why has it been Again, so hard? Again, you know, it comes down to, you know, we look at the hurdles of in, in this order, right? Price, affordability, range, infrastructure, and raw materials. Let's call it the China effect. And if you look at the price, a lot of the price is baked on, well, there's a price of the vehicle, but guess what? If I break my Excel spreadsheet out over 12 to 14 months, you're going to save so much gas that you're going to be, a, you're going to be in the, the win column, not the lose column. And there was too much put on the emphasis of the total cost of ownership of a BEV, which again, is not a problem. But if I have a plug and I am not comfortable with the plug or I don't have the ability to plug it in or any of those lists of why a plug is not for me, it doesn't matter what the price of the vehicle is. And too many people are hanging their hat on, well, as long as we get the affordability down, all of a sudden everyone's gonna rush and buy a BEV. You're telling people to change the way they are thinking in terms of how they fuel their vehicle, whether they can or can't do it. That is the biggest task that people are not really hitting. Each consumer is a snowflake. Each consumer has their own way of looking at that product and saying, what's the best product for me? So that's the real mark here. Yeah, we can go through the list of hurdles and they're all true, 
But if that plug is still disrupted in my life, nothing's going to move that needle for me. But when it comes to affordability, going back to this, we know that Elon Musk, for example, said that this was one of the true things that he was going to try and work on. And yet now we're seeing him pivot away. We're seeing other mass market uh, automakers, for example, also sort of struggling to, to reach this hurdle. To what extent, for example, is the new competition out of China a, a new dissuasion factor for a lot of these automakers, for Tesla, Yeah, so let's example. look at first the Tesla in that conversation, right? Tesla, the biggest fear Elon has is to be called a car company. He doesn't want to be called a car company because Making cars is very difficult. It's costly. It takes three years to line up your suppliers. There's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of liability. He just was the best one in the market, and the first one in the market. And, it's a, and Teslas are phenomenal vehicles. I'm not discounting that. But now he's becoming a real car company. People are questioning his ability to produce at margins. He's now pulling back production. He at one time wanted 20 million cars per year, which no one believed, right? Now he's saying, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to use existing capacity. I'm going to get a robo taxes. Robo taxes let me decontent a vehicle, which brings my cost down and my margins up. And he wants to get an AI. He always wants to be an innovator, not a car company. Now, the China effect. China says, look, we've been learning from the Western manufacturers for 30 years. When you come into China, you need a partnership to come into China. We're going to learn and we're eventually going to grow. They want global dominance and they want market share. When China looks at a market, they're not going to look at how much money we're going to make. They look at how much I, market share I can get. And every vehicle manufacturer that's in the BEV space is losing money. Other than Tesla, they're losing money. I mean, Rivian's losing $38,000 per car. Ford's losing $100,000 per BEV. But that's all about how do we move this market share needle because this net sum carbon zero, that's our goal. So when China comes into market and they say, look, we already have a 20 to 30% price differential to a benefit us. We can walk in. We've learned what the consumer wants because we've been watching for 30 years. We're going to walk in a market that is mandating BEVs and say, look what we got. This was the European problem. European said, Europe said, well, you have to buy a BV. They go, great. I got this BYD over here that's $10,000 cheaper. They said, oh, wait a second. That's not what we really meant. We really meant you got to be a European BEV. Say, well, are you satisfying a carbon footprint or are you satisfying a financial concern and keeping the companies afloat? These problems will always butt heads, that the, the carbon footprint and the financial concerns. So China is a threat because what it's doing is it's making people be more competitive with their pricing. The idea that early adopters were there and they were buying $100,000 vehicles, uh, BEVs, that's over. The early adopters have adopted. Now we need the mass market movers. And those mass market movers need a $45,000 option. And that's where China is going to exceed because they just want market share outside of China. Mm. And how long is it going to take those legacy car makers from the Western countries to catch up in that case? Are they already so far behind that their their lunch is getting eaten? You know, they're right not now? so far behind. The the you know the issue right now is China had such a huge push and that no one realized it. You know, when I'm in the forecasting business, our job is to realize this stuff. You know, back in the '80s, no one thought that the Japanese were going to do well in North America because we had land yachts and and they had these small vehicles and a fuel crisis and they killed it. The Korean manufacturers came in with a poor product, but listened to the consumer and now they're forced to be reckoned with the chinese on how you know if you rip out an engine and transmission it's a fairly easy vehicle to build you know you got some batteries you got some motors you got to make it look cool the new consumer is more emotionally spent on the vehicle they're so socially motivated i make the joke all the time if i was a car company today i'd mock up five of them and give them the five top tiktokers on the planet i get 20, 10 million eyeballs in, in 24 hours and we say that jokingly but it's the new reality that car companies can be car companies without proven because Wall Street and the financial community says, oh, there's an next Tesla. Let's give them $4 billion valuation with zero cars. Mm. So there's this, break, there's this break in valuation and what a car company can really be. So China, what it does is just show, it shows there's another issue to attend to, that there's a competition out there that can build a valuable, high value product for a consumer at a reasonable price with very little concern about overhead and margin, just market share. The legacies can't afford to do that. They have the constant issue of legacy costs and employment and reading margin goals at the same time trying to build an affordable vehicle. You get only affordability when your volume goes up. So it's this vicious cycle of I got to get my volume up so I got to charge a lot, but I can't charge a lot because no one's buying them. So I got to get them down in the bottom end again. How do you get that perfect balance? It's going to take a while to figure that out. 
These car companies are, of course, trying to straddle this line between the old world, their legacy internal combustion mm -hmm. engine vehicles, uh, which probably have uh, higher profit margins, of course, and the new world of electric vehicles, which are supposed to be the future but aren't really paying off. How difficult is that for them right now? We've, of course, seen some schedules shifting in the U.S., especially in terms of rolling out new models. Yeah, I mean, look where the money's being made. If we look at the U.S., money made on trucks, pickup trucks. So GM, Ford, and Stellantis, that's where they thats where they live in the pickup truck space. High, high value in there. And that is the last you know, line of defense. If you can move a, B, a pickup truck buyer to BEV, that's going to be a big move. We're not calling for that anytime soon. That's going to be a very tough task. Ford tried to do it with the Lightning. They did okay. They came out with these monster numbers that, no, that we didn't, never believed, and they came at a fraction of the volume. Again, it's a great vehicle. It's just not a mass market mover the way they want to move it. GM is coming out with pickup trucks and they're going to be, you know, pushing high five, six, five figures, six figures in an unaffordable space. That's where they play. Large pickup trucks, large SUVs, things that are very difficult to electrify affordable. So that's a U.S. problem. European problems a little different, right? They're more of a small vehicle, but they're getting this idea of, well, I have a small Chinese vehicle to come in competition. But we're seeing pushback. We're also seeing pushback that there is this thought out there that if I buy a BEV today, I'm done. I'm a BEV owner forever. And we're hearing BEV owners and studies come out and say, well, maybe I want to go back to ICE or maybe I want to downgrade to hybrid. So this idea that we're just checking people off a box and up, you're a BEV, I don't have to worry about you ever again because now I got to worry about this ICE buyer over here. That's not the case. So we got to look at this market a little, uh, a little more intelligently, right? We got to say, we need hmm. momentum. If I go from moving 20% of my portfolio BEV to 25% in a year, that is a good move of my, of my market. I should not get penalized by the government by hitting these targets that are unobtainable. I should be rewarded by saying, look, you just moved your market 40%. Now, if you do that each year, sure, in 10 years, you might be at 60% of your portfolio, but you're not going to be at 100. But take those wins. Get people to buy BEVs. Get people to buy hybrids. And yes, get people to buy ICE because the internal combustion engine is so efficient right now. But this idea of this, you're either with us, you're against this BEV story, mm. it, it's it's – it's lunacy from our perspective. You need a balanced portfolio because there's a lot of consumers with their own way of how they want to look at a product. Are, are we going to see more of these car makers piling into hybrids, for example, uh, because the market there seems to be so much more uh, dynamic? Yeah, we, you know, we, we also make the other joke, Toyota never gets it wrong. They always get it right. And it taught me it maybe it takes a little while, maybe, you know, because everyone thought, are you crazy? You had that Prius, you could erode that right into the electrification sunset. You know, Tesla wouldn't even exist. That's not true. Tesla is a sports car company that just so happened to be electrified. Toyota said, look, this is not the all you can eat uh, uh, por por powertrain offering. This is one of many offerings. We want to look at fuel cells. We look at hydrogen 20, 30 years from now. Now, they admitted they might have missed the acceleration curve, but there's no way they missed the boat and saying, yep. We should have been all BEV. This idea, you know, it comes in waves. You got to push it down a consumer's throat, hope that a bunch of consumers jump on, learn from it, and then it always dials back. It rarely goes in 45 degree curves when it comes to adoption rates, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. And I would say we're in a valley, but we're at a higher valley. You know, everything is moving in a positive direction. If we go from 8%, maybe to 7%, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to complain. I think that's great if you can maintain it. If you go from 8% to 10%, that's a massive win. When you're talking about 16 to 17 million units of vehicles sold in the U.S. any given year, and you're moving one to two million of them as BEVs, not to mention you're going to hybridize your powertrain too, you got to get people a balanced portfolio. You got to convince them a plug is not a disruptor. So what happens? You give them an extended range vehicle. Hey, there's an engine. There's a, there's a battery. The engine's just a generator. If the plug you feel it's not a disruptor in your life, then maybe next time you'll buy a BEV. But at a minimum, I moved the, the carbon footprint a little bit. You know, Toyota did a study, and I think that, that don't quote me exactly, but I think it was the raw materials to make one BEV, I can make six plug-ins or I can make 90 standard hybrids. So if my goal is to move a carbon footprint, I'd rather move 90 people 25% of the way there than one person 100%. Because that is the true move of fixing the environmental impact. But it's too politicized. It's so polarizing. You know, right. it's either with us or you're against us. And this idea that a middle ground is definitely needed in the conversation and less penal uh, penalties on manufacturers that are trying to build mm. a business and 
trying to sell right. right product in this balanced portfolio pers this perspective. And of course, in this market here in Europe, there are more penalties, there are more rules, it's much more restrictive. There is a deadline for these car makers. What does that mean for these car yeah. makers? Uh, deadline, it's a target, right? We, you know, they're deadlines, but they're always targets and they always move. I mean, California's been trying it for years. Let's set it and they just you ca ca keep moving it. The, dead, the This deadline, we still call a target, is more of a, you know, that's a threat. Let's just see where we're at. Look, if it's 100% by 35 or 50, then if we get to 75%, that's a monster, monster win. Right. But you got to look at manufacturing. If I have a plant that builds ICE vehicles and I have a plant that builds BE vehicles, I have a labor issue, I have a cost issue. I can't run them both at 50 percent utilization and make money. I can't say, well, that's great. I'll just up my BEV to some re respectable number and I'll downgrade my ICE because now my cost structure gets busted. And now Wall Street and the investment community will penalize me because I'm not meeting my margins. You know, it's not SimCity out there. We're not turning on lights and dropping plants out of helicopters and saying that's built right there. There is a lot of movement in the automotive space. The automotive space is glacial in speed. There are suppliers today bidding on parts on that won't be built for three years from today. Now that vehicle might be around for five years. So if, if you look at it, I'm making a part of a vehicle that's gonna be here eight years from today. And that may cross one, two, three political cycles in the process. Way too many parts. So these targets, there's no way the targets will be hit from our perspective. We think they're nice goals, um, but I think they just show improvement to meet that goal. Then I think that everything's going to be, uh, they'll, they'll move those targets and those deadlines further out. That's Joe McCabe, Auto Forecast Solutions. Thank you Thank very you much. Steven.